Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, the scripture text is taken from Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to be reading verse 1 and then skipping over to verse 9 and reading 9 through 13. The he that's being spoken of here is Jesus. And this is what it says. It says, And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And then in verse 9, And as he, Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And it happened that as he was reclining at table in the house, behold, many tax gatherers and sinners came and joined Jesus and his disciples at the table. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with the tax gatherers and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are ill. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Pray with me. Lord, give us ears that hear and feet that move, eyes attentive to your call that we might follow. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The way the story goes is that all the animals in the forest divided up teams to play a football game. I think there's a football game this afternoon. And in this football game, they thought the teams were pretty well divided, pretty even. That is until they gave the ball to the rhinoceros. The rhinoceros ran down the field. Nobody could tackle him. Scored a touchdown every time he touched the ball. Well, the other team thought, what do we do? There's no, no defense against the rhinoceros. And so they thought, well, maybe when we're on offense, all we do is just run around and maybe we can run the clock out to halftime. And then he'll get bored and go home. Well, that's not what happened. The rhinoceros ran down the field. Halftime came, and the rhinoceros team was ahead by four touchdowns. They went to the locker room. They were dejected, wondering how in the world. They were going to kick off at the beginning of the, 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 the second half to the rhinoceros team and knew they were going to score again. They made their way back out on the field, kicked off. Sure enough, the ball went to the rhinoceros. The rhinoceros took two steps and wham, down to the turf he went. They began pulling animals off the pile and there at the bottom of the pile, it was the centipede. The centipede had, had tackled the rhinoceros. So they said, where have you been? We've been looking for you the whole half. And that's when the centipede said, I was putting on my shoes. That was an old joke the first time it was told. <laughs> not, not very funny, but I do like the point, is that a lot of times folks spend all their lives getting ready and never get on the field. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The word follow, the, f the word follow, it means get in the game. Get in there. Get going. Follow. And that's the word that I want to talk about this morning. That Jesus doesn't wait till we're better than we have been to call us to follow. He doesn't wait till we're good as we could be to get in the game and follow. 
He doesn't wait till we're the best that we'll ever be to get in the game and to follow. He calls us now, today, just where we are. But a lot of folks don't follow. A lot of folks don't follow because they get stuck in the past. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. Verse 1, it says, And getting into the boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. That Jesus is in his own city. And when he passed by the tax office, as far as we know, that's the only interaction that he had had with Matthew. Except that it was his own city. The chances were very good that Jesus knew Matthew from his past. That Jesus, as a carpenter, was taxed along with everybody else. And the tax gatherer was known by everyone in the city because the tax gatherer was the one that was hated the most of anyone in the city. The tax gatherer was the one that had collaborated with the occupying government, with the Roman government. Not just interviewed for a job, but bid for it. He paid money to have that job. Because the job as tax gatherer, it was a license to steal. The Roman government had assessed a city, a region, a certain amount of money. And anything the tax gatherer got over and above that, he got to keep. And it was the tax gatherer. The Roman government liked to get a a local tax gatherer who knew where the money was. Who knew just how many sheep a farmer had. That the wool that was taxed, a local knew it. Or the farmer who might have that field a little bit farther from the barn. A local would know where that was. Where a stranger might never be able to locate it. That a local would know who brought their goods to town on a cart. Because carts were taxed by the number of wheels that they had. Chances were good that Jesus knew Matthew because he was in his own city. Chances were good that Jesus had been robbed by Matthew. And if Jesus hadn't been robbed by Matthew, those he knew had been. And still, he calls Matthew. He doesn't wait till he's good as he could be, or better than he had been, or the best that he possibly could be. He calls him. He calls him aware of his past. Years ago, I used to to watch uh, Late Night with Tom Schneider. And um, that was a long time ago. And the show, Tom Schneider was kind of an eccentric host. He had a lot of little things that that made him peculiar to watch but he had incredible guests and this particular night I remember well I, his guest was a fellow named Itzhak Perlman well I'd never heard of Itzhak Perlman I didn't know who he was but when he began to play the violin I'd never heard music on any instrument like that before I later came to find out that Itzhak Perlman may be one of the greatest violinists that's ever lived A virtuoso on his instrument. And so every time that I saw or heard a story or that he was going to be on TV, I I made sure to tune in to to, to what he said or to what he did. Well, the story I read about Itzhak Perlman is he was giving a concert at Lincoln Center. And there he was beginning to play a a violin solo with the orchestra and his string broke. It popped so loud that the conductor heard the string break and so did the orchestra well the the conductor began to cut off the orchestra but Itzhak Perlman waved him off and continued to play a solo a virtuoso solo meant for four strings he began to play it on three strings that in his head he was rewriting the music as he played it well of At the end of the piece, the the orchestra rose to give him a standing ovation, as did the conductor, realizing just how incredible a feat it was for him to to play this piece. And that's when Itzhak Perlman said, Sometimes the artist's task is to find out how much music you can still make with what you have left. Sometimes the artist's task is to find out 
how much music you can still make with what you have left. All of us are broken. All of us have a past. And all of us, that past, that brokenness, it's not a surprise to Jesus. He doesn't wait till we're as good as we could be or better than we had been or the best that we're going to be. That Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That knowing quite fully what, not only what we were capable of, but what we'd done and what we might do, Jesus still gave His life on the cross for you and for me to wipe away that brokenness, to wipe away those sins once and for all. That our past doesn't disqualify us from following Jesus. The word is follow. But still, some people get stuck in the past. Some people also get stuck in the the present, and that's the second thing that I want to talk about. It says in, his, in verse 9, And as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office. Matthew, in the tax office. That was his place. That was his role. That's what he had always done. That's where he had focused his life, the tax office. Remember when I was in college, The dorm I lived in only had one TV. That shows how long ago it was. That TV was in the lobby. And people would gather around the TV for different things. There was one group that watched soap operas every afternoon. I understand they'd even schedule their classes so they could catch their soap soap opera there on TV. And, And they would gather around and swap stories with each other about the soap opera and where they were. And I, other times it would be the news. 11 o'clock news, I was passing through the lobby one day, began to to watch the 11 o'clock news that night. And there on the news, the lead story was about an airplane pilot in Atlanta who had had landed his his airplane in the Kmart parking lot. And the reporter was there with the cameraman and talking about what an incredible job this pilot did with, with no engine power, was able to glide over the the power lines and miss the the tel- the the light poles and land safely in the Kmart parking lot. Well, the the reporter was was very very excited about it, and then he got the the microphone and he stuck it in the pilot's face. And that's when I said, I know that guy. It turned out to be a guy that in high school I had wrestled several times, and that summer <laughs> I saw him. And I said, hey, I saw you on the evening news. I said, you got your moment of fame. They were right there interviewing about how, what a great job you did overcoming the power lines, overcoming the light poles. Well, he had this embarrassed look on his face. And I, I said, you know, they talked about what a great job you did, but they didn't ask, why did you have to land in the Kmart parking lot? And that's when he said, well, I was trying to earn my my pilot's license, he said, and it was uh, my first solo night flight. He said, I was supposed to be following I-85 north, and there was a runway I was going to land in and refuel and fly back. But instead, I got so focused on the highway and the cars that were in front of me and following the lights at night, I was not following I-85, I was following I-285. And I flew around in circles until I ran out of gas. <laughs> well, there are times that being focused is a really good thing. But there are other times when being too focused on the present, too focused on what's in front of us, and missing out that Jesus calls us to more in life. More in life than that that's just in front of us. That, that's just than, than what's most obvious. During this pandemic, it's been a time where the word for the day is fear. 
And the news story is be afraid, or if it's not be afraid, it's be very afraid, or be very, very afraid. And we've had a tendency to circle our wagons, to hunker down, and to be afraid. And to miss out that Jesus says follow. That the present hasn't caught Jesus off guard. It hasn't caught Jesus unaware. That God has called us to a power, an eternity, a hope that's greater than, than just what's going on right now today. Isaiah 41.10, God says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not look anxiously about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Hear the good news. God has you in his hand. He's not been caught unaware. He's not been caught off guard. And the power of the risen Christ is stronger than the power of fear. The power of the risen Christ calls us to follow. To follow, not get stuck in the present, but to follow. The word is follow. follow it might be that we're in a place in a role in something that we always do Jesus has more the word is follow but still some don't follow because they get stuck they get stuck in the present some don't follow because they get stuck in the past and the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is some don't follow because they get stuck practicing the wrong things Jesus calls Matthew and as soon as Jesus calls Matthew it turns out that that other folks other tax gatherers begin to to gather at the table there and the sinners begin to to eat with Jesus and and that's when the Pharisees that half of of this reading is about the Pharisees the Pharisees saw that Jesus and his disciples were eating with the, these tax gatherers and sinners. And their words are, why? Why? It's the tax gatherers and sinners in verse 11 that reveal that they've been practicing. They've been practicing the wrong things. And it's possible. It's very possible to practice the wrong things. Sometimes you learn the things that you, you know best by example. And I've discovered that I learned as much, if not more, by a bad example than I do a good example. I remember when I was in high school, I loved to wrestle. I wrestled uh, with the high school team, and then after practice, I'd go wrestle with the college team at Southern Tech. Sometimes on the weekends, I'd go wrestle at Georgia Tech. All summer long, Georgia Tech would keep their field house open, and wrestlers from all over the southeast would drive on Sundays and they were, we'd be wrestling high school and college wrestlers there at Georgia Tech. And one summer, it was my junior year, I began wrestling the, the, the freestyle tournaments. The Olympic style is what freestyle is. And um, won state championship. And they gathered together a team of all the state champions from the state of Georgia. And they took the second and third place as well. And they, they sent us to Iowa to wrestle in the nationals. They gave us a coach. And for several weeks, we prepared for the national tournaments there in Iowa. This coach, he'd been a good college wrestler, but I'll go ahead and tell you, he wasn't much of a coach because his coaching was always what we, we shouldn't do, what we needed to stay away from, and to practice what we should never do. That, and he'd say, well, those boys from Iowa, they're going to turn you into a knot if you, if you do that. You can't do that with the boys from Iowa. They'll eat your lunch. The, bo- the boys from Oklahoma, they'll eat your lunch if you try that move with them. And it, 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 the boys from Pennsylvania, uh, they, they'll destroy you, destroy you, on the, embarrass you on the mat if you do that move. Well, the wrestlers that were there, they were all pretty good. I mean, everybody there was state champion. But he kept telling us what we couldn't do. We practiced. Rather than what we could do, we practiced what we we couldn't do. What we ought never do. And it was predictable. When we got to the national tournament, the Georgia team was destroyed. With one exception, the kid who never came to practice. That he talked to his high school coach 
who opened the field house and he and some of his high school teammates would wrestle. And that was the one kid who did well, who did very well. The kid who, who didn't practice the wrong things. Well, the Pharisees had been practicing the wrong things. You see, the Pharisees had been practicing making lists. In their heart, there was a list, an A list. And on this A list, these were the folks that believed like them. These were the folks that behaved like them. On this list, these were the folks that belonged like they did. And they practiced this list over and over, but it wasn't the only list. They, they had another list that they would practice. This, this list was folks, the folks that did not believe like them, the folks that did not behave like them, the folks that did not belong like they did. And this list was a very, very long list. Matthew was on the list, so were the other sinners, the other tax collectors. And what Jesus does to the Pharisees, that he invites them, invites them to lose the list, to learn what this means. In verse 13, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Here in this pandemic, I think like no other time, we've been called to, to isolation, being alone, to consider what's going on around us, what's going on in our past. And the natural tendency is to make lists of those that believe, those that belong, those that behave like we do, the killer bees, and those that don't behave and belong and believe like we do. Those that have hurt us. Those that are us and those that are them. Those that are enemies and those that are allies. Those that are sheep and those that are goats. And we've had a tendency Rather than learning compassion to, to learn how to make that jail even stronger and the bars even thicker for those that we've tried, those that we've convicted, those that we've sentenced. As if our world will be safe. If we're able to close the, the door and imprison them forever. Jesus calls the Pharisees and you and me to something more, to a compassion. A compassion that, that we allow the same forgiveness to another that we forgive ourselves with. That we give them the same break that we forgive and we give the break that we give ourselves the way Colossians 3.12 says, it says, And so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive. This morning, is there someone on your list maybe someone that's hurt you Jesus knows what that's like Matthew Matthew very well may have been the one that stole from Jesus or at least he was the one that that Jesus knew those that Jesus knew those that Jesus loved that he had hurt them have you tried to keep them imprisoned on a list of enemies, on a list of goats, on a list of, of them that don't believe, behave, and belong, on your list. The power of Jesus Christ has strength that you and I don't have. That strength was strong enough 
strong enough on the cross to forgive you and me. And he rose from the grave to give that strength to us. The risen Christ, alive in you and me, able to do what we can't do on our own, to break the bars of that prison of unforgiveness, to break the bars that we might live a heart of compassion, of forgiveness, a heart of kindness and humility, of goodness and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. This morning, I want to invite you, invite you to pray with me that the power of the risen Christ might be alive in you this day and you receive that power, power to forgive yourself all that is past and to follow. Power, power to, to focus not on just what's present, not just where you are, not just your place, your role, and what you've always done, but to follow. Power. Power to trust in His Holy Spirit that you can forgive and show compassion. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, breathe. Breathe the power of Your Spirit on us this morning that we might know that strength. Strength that maybe that person that's hurt us, that we're able this day to begin to forgive. Or maybe it's that person that, that's hurt deeply, one that we, we love. And, and we've, we've tried, we've sentenced them, and we've imprisoned them never to be forgiven again. That only creates a prison for us. Lord, breathe your power on us. Break the bars of that prison that we began to forgive. And grow in us a heart of compassion. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us. <music>